Hello everyone, I'm Kurt Lidke, board chair of Klamath Film, and you just watched Somewhere Confidential, a hilarious, loving parody and tribute of classic film noir detective stories. Uh, this film is going to be screening at the film festival on Saturday, September 28th at 1.30 p.m. And joining us is the director, Casey Siegel. Hello, Casey. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Kurt. Thanks for having me. So the idea of doing a classic film noir, anyone who's a film fan, I'm sure, has grown up on seeing The Maltese Falcon and Double Indemnity, Chinatown, all, all those, those classic old, old films. But uh, I, what I immediately thought of was Steve Martin's Dead Man Don't Wear Plaid. And obviously there's some other nods to say like the Naked Gun trilogy and whatnot, but what ultimately led to deciding that I'm going to make a film set in classic 30s, 40s era d detective stories and then take it to the nth degree in terms of, you know, uh, h hilarity and stupidity in a loving way. <laughs> uh huh. Well, uh, uh, so many different influences came into this uh, this project when me and Aaron Wagner, one of the writers, sat down um, to discuss this. We um, we started with the Big Lebowski, uh, and um, him and his co-writer, I think, were really channeling um, the Naked Gun um, sort of series, and and definitely uh, Mel Brooks and Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Uh, and then um, Eric Napalm, the uh, lead actor, uh, he brought a lot of uh, a lot of Leslie Nielsen um, to the character as well. Uh, he's a he comes from a very strong improv background, and um, that really benefited the movie. Uh, Alex first, our uh, uh, our great cinematographer, uh, he watched a lot of black and white movies. Uh, I, I know he cited. The movie Mank by uh, David Fincher a lot, uh, so we used a lot of practical lighting, uh, and then I, I I I can't help myself but it but include a lot of sort of the creepy, uh, sort of almost David Lynch sort of elements to it. So the 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 elevator pitch that I that I like to tell people is it's like David uh, Naked Gun directed by David Lynch. So. Well, and there's also uh, the classic Reefer Madness film from the 30s that clearly also has a massive influence on, on this film as well. Uh, when you decided that it was a go for this film, did you have like a, a giant watch party of old classic black and white detective stories or just give all of your cast a, a listing of you need to watch this, this, this to kind of get in the vibe for what we're trying I to do? I definitely gave gave out a list and uh, and uh, again, people brought their own influences and I think that's uh, there was very much that kind of collaborative uh, atmosphere where uh, um, everybody sort of was coming at it from slightly different angles, but uh, ultimately we uh, you know, we, we we all sort of seem to I, I sort of had a a a mantra uh anytime we kind of got stuck on where to go uh my response would generally be when in doubt make it weird which uh how much how perfect is that for portland right uh and you could definitely see the summer comp the, the uh, uh reefer madness uh influence in there uh literally uh there's there's the scene where he walks he wanders into the universe for a moment uh we also i'm a big fan of including easter eggs so in almost every single scene the maltese falcon is hiding somewhere in the background so that's something to look for on a repeat viewing for sure uh, how do you go about putting something in a different era, uh, finding old classic cars and putting things in a classic time frame? Uh, that I'm sure, you know, there's cast and crew that uh, are heavily involved in, in set design and, and whatnot, but it's not always easy to find things that are 30s, 40s era to make it believable. Mm -hmm. Well, what, that's one of my favorite things about filmmaking is just the uh, uh, the the things you sort of. Sometimes it takes a lot of work, and sometimes you sort of just stumble into uh, into it. And and that that amazing classic car, which is is just such a perfect uh, 
mix between you know the classic car look but it's also a little bit beat up and and you know missing paint and everything which is just so perfect for the character of Guthrie uh that was just a random encounter on the street uh our screenwriter Aaron um literally chased this guy down so I'm driving around on the uh on the street and and chased him down until the guy pulled over and thought he was going to get in a fight or something and ended up being a really nice guy. And uh, next thing you know, he, he contributed his car and, and, uh, and, you know, the rest was just a, you know, great uh, gathering of, of resources and, and materials and, and a lot of great production design work from, uh, you know, a great group of people. So tell me about the the timeline of this project in terms of when it began. Um, this was a very lengthy project to complete, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this actually the this this journey actually began all the way back in 2019 uh, when me and Aaron sat down and, and just just wanted just decided let's make something. Uh, and after a lot of discussion, uh, I brought up this uh, this this article about the Big Lebowski, and, and we started talking about the idea of of a stoner noir and what does that mean what might that look like so at the time we just decided to make a fake trailer for a movie that that was never intended to be made and that turned into a little short film called the devil's lettuce which uh uh was just a fun quick little project that we sort of just tied these disparate you know this would be a funny scene and this would be a funny scene and all you need is a little narration to tie it all together uh and then we finished that and we had a really great time making that and then the pandemic hit and you know everybody was looking for things to do during the pandemic so uh aaron decided you know this is so much fun like i want to turn it into a, a feature script so he went off and and uh and him and his screenwriting partner richie stratton sat down and and uh started writing this thing out and they would send me drafts and I would, I would send them back extensive notes. And we went back and forth like that for, you know, 16, 17 rounds of, of heavy revisions. And, uh, and then things started loosening up post pandemic. And, uh, and then we, uh, we started filming in uh, spring 2022, we had to take a break to, to, uh, gather the rest of our funds to finish filming and finished filming in uh spring 2023 and um and uh i was editing through that entire time and and uh finally wrapped it up around the beginning of the new year so it was a very long process so your cast for for this when you're making something like i would have loved to have just been a fly on the wall when something like the naked gun was being made because or any you know mel brooks film ever like it has to be the hardest thing to not break character and just start cracking up over how absurd some of the things and i know some of your cast come from the improv world and so you know they're they're used to it but um some of those legendary comedies i, I remember reading in an uh an interview it was uh, Rodney Dangerfield on Caddyshack thought that he was bombing horribly and the film was going terrible because he kept saying, no one's laughing. It's like, Rodney, if they laugh, it ruins the take. You know, they, they, they can't right. laugh. You're stealing, <laughs> you're stealing the entire film, right? Um, when you're making uh -huh. something this silly and weird and absurd, how many takes were ruined because someone just kind of collectively lost it? Well, you saw a few of them at the end of the the movie and the the credits, and believe me, there are a lot more of that. Uh, I mean, a, a, a true credit to Eric, uh, who was who was an absolute pro, because so many of those takes, we were all just absolutely cracking up and and you know laughing so hard we couldn't we could barely breathe. Uh, it, it, I mean. Uh, it, it was it was a real challenge to cut this thing together because there was a lot of improv and a lot of the takes were vastly different and i would tell eric let's just play on this one let's play on this one and uh and he would he was always always game to to throw throw a curveball and 
luckily we had such a talented uh, uh, cast of, of improv actors who were always ready and willing to to take the challenge and run with it. So uh, I really think all the improv seriously elevated an already great script. Uh, it's not just those on camera, but behind the scenes. Uh, did you ruin more than a couple of times? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of a lot of laughing, and and I mean, couldn't help but be in in Eric's eye line a lot of times, just ab just just absolutely dying laughing, and he's only he's only human, you know. They're, so he definitely he would see us cracking up in the background, and just just couldn't keep it together. And that was, uh, I mean, they they were. Uh, you know, look, this was a very low budget project. Uh, so we had a lot of very long days and it was a lot of work, but uh, really what got us through it was just so much laughter. And, and I mean, it was it was a lot of fun to make. Locations as well. I mean, you're based in Portland. I'm sure most of it was shot in Portland, but there's also a few scenes that get outside of the city limits. So where are the places that you filmed? Uh, we shot uh, uh, several really crucial scenes in the Dells. Uh, we shot at the the Neon Sign Museum at the Dells, um, and we shot uh, at the um, I'm blanking on the name of the winery, but they were they were great. They uh, that's the drive-in that he wakes up, and um, yeah, I I, th I really think the the um, locations of this. Uh, this movie are, are one of the, the strongest parts and I love, you know, I, I, I think it really helped build the character of, of this fictional town that we just started, we just started calling somewhere USA. Uh, and it kind of became a character in of itself. Any uh, really memorable, either happy accidents or bloopers, obviously you have a gag reel at, at the end during your credits, but anything really stand out where, you know, every film to a certain extent is really all about problem solving, right? So like we have a major dilemma, need to roll, something's broken, or we left something behind, or then also at the same time, something accidentally happened and now you can look back and, and laugh about it. Uh, anything really stand out over the course of several years of production on this, of uh, something uh, related to this film that's always going to stick with you? Well, in a lot of ways, this this uh, this movie wasn't just just the improv heavy on the acting side. There were a lot of moments where where we were really responding to major curveballs in the moment. Uh, I guess the the first one that really sticks out to me is the uh, um, the pool scene. Uh, that was uh, that was vastly different uh, on the page and it went through several different changes. Uh, we almost got rained out. Um, there was, there was a, there was a period of time where he was going to run through, uh, a, uh, a, a different film that was shooting and it was going to be all of, all of the crew, uh, there. And that was where we learned that crew aren't necessarily actors. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, ultimately it was it was just a lot of uh a lot of problem solving um and uh um i'm just i'm i'm really thrilled with uh, a lot of the the locations and the, the places that we came up with the raven's manor was a great location that's where the second bar is there um he goes and, and orders a, the drink and has his flashback and uh Funhouse Lounge and the the clown room uh, that was definitely a standout where the the big orgy scene happens. That was a, a room that was covered from top to bottom in, in different clown portraits. Uh, and the, just the the we we put out an open casting call for this uh, orgy of weirdos, and boy did they show up. Uh, there's a lot of a great footage from that that got left on the cutting room floor. Um, I mean, again, this this was a very difficult movie to edit just because of all the great stuff that it, we had to cut out. Now that it's out in the world to see, what kind of reactions have you gotten from it? Uh, people seem to really enjoy it. Uh, uh, we we had a little cast and crew screening in Portland uh, in May, and and uh, uh, it it was it was so it was so great. People were laughing from start to finish, and 
And somebody told me that they had a, a, a either a big smile on their face or, or was laughing the entire time. And uh, it was um, it was really great. Everybody really seemed to enjoy it. And uh, there's uh, I, I, I do want to say there is there is uh, um, this this movie came out or we started working on this movie just uh, shortly after my father passed away. And, the, and there's some um, there's some real heartfelt tributes to him in there and and i'm i know that he would uh he would really approve of of this and um i'm glad that i was able to you know the song that that you see me playing in the in the bar when he walks in is uh um it's a song that he wrote and we're doing like our own little cover version of it and uh that was a really meaningful um thing and getting that in front of audiences i think is is my little way of, of attributing it to him and, was your dad a fan of old classic detective movies then oh yeah or... definitely yeah he he <laughs> he brought me up those like serials and i mean definitely raised me on on indiana jones and uh and you know the the maltese falcon and sunset boulevard and all those classics and um yeah i really uh means a lot that i was able to 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 throw in some tributes to him while still making this a um you know i think it's a very funny movie and people seem to respond to it had you worked had you worked on comedy before this film so that that's an interesting thing is is, is uh most of my pri previous projects had been very deeply personal uh dramatic sort of it was it was kind of me working through something uh you know uh, a form of, of therapy if you will um but this movie uh this absolutely silly stupid movie uh like was was by far the most actually therapeutic i mean again being on set really dedicating myself to this thing and laughing my ass off uh every day you know with with this this really dedicated group of, of people and then and, and then pouring myself into it and, and editing uh that was was so much more therapeutic and and healing for me than um trying to process it through some sort of a dramatic uh you know over serious sort of uh endeavor and uh and one of the last times I remember talking to my dad about uh, about my film projects is, is he's like, please, could you please let your main character live at the end of this movie or the next movie that you did? And, and he lives and uh, he's, he's got more adventures, hopefully, to to to, to show. And uh, we've got lots of ideas for future projects uh, and future adventures in the world of somewhere. So. So we'll see. So having worked in a lot of drama, um, was that a difficult transition to be able to do such slapstick comedy? One, one thing that I've always felt about comedy is that it only works if the people involved play it straight. Like if, if you're mm -hmm. laughing along to the joke too, it kind of ruins the moment. But like Le Leslie Nielsen, we mentioned Naked Gun. What makes those films so great is how deadpan he is throughout mm -hmm. how absurd and silly everything that he's going through is. He's playing it like the very classic, you know, dragnet style detective. And that's what mm -hmm. makes it funny. So uh, coming from more of a dramatic background, how were you able to kind of balance that between trying to make it still be serious in the midst of this very absurd you know scenario that you're laying out. well in a, in a lot of circumstances it was uh directing it as though it, it is a, a a drama um i mean uh guthrie is a, is a very he's presented as a very hard-boiled you know serious uh uh detective you know he's he's a bit of a buffoon but he's uh uh he's he's uh you know he he i think he takes himself pretty seriously in a lot of of, of uh moments and that's why I, I really love uh 
uh, parodies and spoofs uh, because you can direct them uh, as as a drama and you kind of let the circumstances and the and the uh uh the settings and then the um it's not so much that you know slapstick i mean we we have a few pratfalls in this movie but but for the most part i was very conscientious about about no fart jokes for example uh and we really wanted you know to keep a straight face as much as possible uh and you know like we certainly have some some comic relief characters in the comedy i, I would say this this the his siblings are are sort of uh very wacky side characters and then abraham is definitely a wacky side character but nobody is really presented as a as a clown and uh um really like you know as as somebody who loves uh film noir and and uh and the the gravitas that, that come with those sort of films it was a lot of fun to pay homage to uh those types of that type of genre while also making this ridiculous movie as you know very you know well also you know keeping that mantra in mind of when in doubt, make it weird. Any aspect of uh, the production behind Summer Confidential we haven't talked about yet that you think is really important people should know? Um, I don't know. I mean, it it, it really could have been, um, I guess this is true for, for a lot of movies, but there this there is uh, an infinite number of movies this this uh film could have turned out to be with all the different improv that happened and everything and uh um it was just it was just a, a lot of, of work and a lot of uh difficult choices finding the the best take and the funniest improv moment and and uh and what to keep and what to throw out and uh um there's a there's a lot of uh Again, I, I am some somebody who really enjoys uh Easter eggs. So there's uh there's a lot in there uh that I've snuck in the background and and uh and I I I really try to make it fun for multiple viewings. So uh so anybody who, who watches it at a second time, I would I would pay close attention to the background because there's a lot of fun things going on back there. It could be like during screenings of the room where people throw plastic spoons every time you see a falcon throw it throughout like a little bird. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> well, well, Casey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for making this wonderful film that just brightened our day. And uh, we look forward to future projects from you and all, all of your uh, crazy collaborators. Uh, so Summer Confidential will screen at the Climate Independent Film Festival on Saturday, September 28th at 1.30 p.m. and be available on demand through Eventive for two weeks. Casey, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and for making this wonderful film. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.